Father, we ask that as we look at your word this morning, you might speak to us by your spirit. Speak to us however we feel today, whatever situation we're in. Speak to us with your words of comfort and love and acceptance. In Jesus' name. Amen. So how are you? How are you today? When someone asks that question, I wonder how you instinctively respond. The defensive reaction and the reaction that most people tend to give when asked that question is fine. However, they're really feeling. But fine sometimes can be true. Sometimes you are feeling great. But other times, fine is just a way of saying, I don't want to talk about how I really am. And often the question, how are you, doesn't really want a truthful answer. Because as you can see on this slide, behind that word fine might be all sorts of other words, broken, useless, alone, clueless, confused, betrayed, later on, lonely, bitter, rejected, crushed, feeling like I'm going to fall apart, empty, defeated, never good enough. That question, how are you, can, not always, but can be very superficial, both in how it's asked and how it's answered. We may feel very different to that. And when we come to church, whether in person or virtually, how are we before God? Do we come with our best hat on, not necessarily literally these days, but metaphorically? Do we come putting our best appearance? Do we come with a mask that says to everyone in church and to God, I'm fine, whatever we're like inside, however messed up and broken we might be feeling? In our Bible readings today, both from our Old and New Testament, we find people who come to God as they really are. And it's not always very pleasant. We have a powerful man, a leader from the synagogue. He would have been highly respected, looked up to, trusted. He would have had a reputation to defend. And yet his daughter was ill and dying. And he comes to God in helplessness and desperation. He throws himself on the ground in front of Jesus and begs him to come and heal his daughter. That would have been quite a humiliation for a synagogue leader to do that. To throw himself on the ground in front of this uneducated regional rabbi and to beg him for help. He recognizes that his daughter's situation is so much more important than his own reputation. And we can come to God, we can come to Jesus in our helplessness and desperation. Whatever's really going on, anxiety, headache, numbness, fear, distress, failure. However we feel we've let ourselves down, let others down, let God down. We like Jairus can come to Jesus in our helplessness and desperation. But it doesn't stop there. As a kind of interruption in this story of the healing of Jairus's daughter, we have an even more remarkable story. There is a woman who comes to Jesus, who has been bleeding for 12 years, almost certainly menstrual bleeding. And this would have made her unclean in the eyes of the culture at the time. She was probably a woman who once was relatively wealthy, but we're told she had spent all her money on trying to get cured. Now, medicine wasn't great in those days, but she would have tried all kinds of herbal remedies. She would have gone to all kinds of self-proclaimed healers. She wouldn't have been able to go to the temple in Jerusalem because there women were only allowed in an outer court and women who were ritually unclean as she was because of her bleeding weren't even allowed in there. She was somebody who would have been 
shamed in that culture, right on the edge. She might once have been married, but quite likely she would have been divorced because of the shame of her situation. She's somebody who did not feel accepted. And shame is a terrible thing. It happens in every culture across the world. In some cultures, it's a very dominant thing. You can be shamed because of where you're born, because of what your family or your ancestors have done, because of your gender, because of sexuality, because of the work that you do. All sorts of things can cause shame. And the thing about shame is unlike guilt, Guilt can be assuaged, guilt can be forgiven. Guilt is about something you've done that you can put in the past, but shame is about who you are. And that's very difficult to change. This woman lived with shame. She couldn't even speak to Jesus. She was so ashamed of who she was. And so in desperation, she reached out and touched him and something happened. She knew it immediately. She felt it within her body. She had been set free. But then Jesus stopped and said, who touched me? And at one level, it seemed a stupid question. The disciples certainly thought so, because they said, well, everyone's touching you. You're in a crowd. People are pushing in. But this was something different, and Jesus knew it. And at this point, the woman must have felt even worse. She did not want to be publicly shamed again. She must have felt angry with Jesus when he said, who touched me? And she, she knew she had to admit it was her. And Jesus knew what he was doing. He wasn't seeking to make a public example of this woman to shame her. He knew that her real healing that was so desperately needed was not just of her bleeding, but was of her shame. And he knew that unless he publicly showed that she was accepted, that she couldn't remove that shame. And so after she said, I touched you, he says the most extraordinary word. He simply says, daughter. It's a word of intimacy. It's a word of relationship. It's a word of acceptance and love. He says, daughter, your faith has made you whole. Go in peace. Be freed from your suffering. Those are extraordinary words to hear from Jesus. This whole passage is extraordinary. Because at the center are two women, one a little girl and children were seen as unimportant and marginalized in Jewish culture. And women were seen as secondary and often marginal in first century Jewish culture as well. And yet this chapter focuses on how Jesus gave time and attention to a 12 year old girl and to a woman whose society had rejected and shamed. So desperation and helplessness and shame and then we had an extraordinary passage for our first reading. David's lament after the death of Saul and Jonathan in battle. And lament is a very powerful thing in the Bible. We find it frequently, particularly in the Psalms and in the Old Testament. Lament is when you cry out to God in anguish, in anger, sometimes with feelings of bitterness. David has strong words of revenge. He wants to punish those who have killed Saul and Jonathan. He wants even nature to be punished. The hills and the mountains where they died. He wants them to become barren because they saw the death of Jonathan and Saul. It's an extraordinary passage and in it we learn of just how deep David and Jonathan's friendship was. David talks of him as my brother, who was closer to me and who I loved more than the love of women. And some contemporary commentators have seen there the possibility that 
David and Jonathan had an intimate relationship, a sexual relationship. That's not clear from the passage. That may simply be our modern reading into the passage. But what is clear is that this was a very deep friendship that they had. And David's grief was genuine. His anger with the situation, his anger with God was genuine. And David is able to take that grief into God's presence. We have it preserved in scripture in all its rawness. And today, so many of us are grieving. So many of us have lost loved ones in this pandemic and through other situations during these last few years. And we can take that grief to the feet of Jesus as well. Our passages today are about not putting on a face, but coming to God as we really are. Because if we don't truly express our feelings, we very easily sink into depression. Depression is so often caused by trying to hold in what needs to be let out in the way of expressing our feelings. I quite like this slide here. People think of depression just as sadness, but it can be so much more than that. Nothingness, self-loathing, anxiety, guilt, hopelessness, isolation, a whole mixture of feelings all whirling around. Some days one dominates, other days another does. We can bring this to Jesus as well. And just as these passages urge us to be honest with God, I think they also urge us to be honest with each other. So let me summarize. We're invited here to reach out like that woman did in the crowd. We may not even have the words. We may not even be able to verbalize how we're feeling. But reach out and touch Jesus symbolically, metaphorically. With cries, if you haven't got words. We're invited to cry out like David did after the death of Jonathan and Saul, to lament in our helpless pain, to recognize we can't change it. It is what it is, but we can express it to God. We're invited to fall down as Jairus did, to throw ourselves at Jesus' feet, to throw ourselves in the dust and just say, help. I'm at the end of my resources, I need you. And as we do that, we find that God meets us there in our desperation, in our honesty, in our anger and our helplessness. And we can find, as Jairus and his daughter did, as the woman with the flow of blood did, as David did, as shown in his Psalms, that we can discover our identity and we know that in the light of the New Testament to be our identity in Christ, that we are beloved children, that God looks at us and says, daughter, son, be free of your suffering. You don't need to live in shame. If God accepts you, if Jesus calls you son or daughter, then you don't need to live in shame whatever others may think. Discover your identity in Christ and discover God's values, because if that's how God values us, then that's how we must value others too. To love those who society sees as the last, the least and the lost. Those are the values of God's kingdom. Those on the margins, those who are shamed, those who are rejected, those who are seen as expendable, those are the ones who come first in the kingdom of God. And we're challenged to discover the body of Christ. We as church are called to be a loving community of radical acceptance. Where no one is shamed and all are accepted and loved. And finally, we're called to show to others what Jesus has shown to us unconditional love and acceptance. 
as with that woman who reached out and grabbed hold of Jesus' clothing in desperation. Jesus welcomes us and welcomes others with unconditional love and acceptance. So let's be honest when we're asked that question, how are you? Let's be honest with each other as far as we're able to. Some days we just may be able to say, not great, if that's the true answer. We don't have to always go into detail, but there will be times when it's right to. And let's, before God, really be honest, because that's how God welcomes us. And let's hear his words. Daughter, son, you are set free. Set free from what binds you. Lord Jesus, thank you for these extraordinary passages that show Jesus's radical love and acceptance of those whose society rejected and saw as unimportant. Thank you that you want us to come to you with whatever we feel, shame, guilt, helplessness, anger, grief. Thank you that you want to accept and transform us. Help us to see ourselves and others as you do. In Jesus' name, amen.